Hey everyone, welcome to today's podcast. Today we're talking about how to reduce desire for food. If you can do this, obviously weight loss is gonna be a lot easier, right? Um, but people don't really think about this. A lot of times when it comes to dieting, you just assume there's gonna be a tremendous amount of desire for food forever, and you're just gonna fight against it with willpower. So right off the bat, I want you to understand that even before I share the tactic with you, I wanna reinforce the mindset behind it, which is that we wanna make the weight loss process easy. And the, <laughs> one of the most key ways to do that is to bring down your desire for food. Because once we start to reduce the desire, now we don't need so much willpower. Now it becomes much more automatic. So in order to do that, we need to change our mindset. We need to change the way that we think about food. If you continue to think about the foods that you've struggled with in the same way, you're going to continue to struggle with them. So again, th there's no magical Monday where you're going to tap into some limitless amount of willpower and fight against these cravings. What we have to do starting right now is change the way that we think about food. And the simplest way to change the way you think about food in a way that's going to affect the desire you feel for them is whether you're focusing on the anticipation and consumption of the food or the consequence that immediately follows. So remember, these are the three phases of eating. We have the anticipation, looking forward to it, getting excited, building up that desire, the consumption of it, where we have a high desire because it's pleasurable and enjoyable to do it. But then there's the consequence that follows immediately after we finish the food. And so we have been conditioned through millions and millions and millions of food ads, more than that probably, um, to always focus on the getting of the food, the eating of the food, and that's it. And now we may say, well, I don't, the one consequence we do think about sometimes is I don't want to put the weight on, but that consequence is too far in the future to really affect us now. So we have to start conditioning ourselves to look at the consequence of immediately after we finish eating the food. And the consequence specifically, ironically, it's not just the physical one. The physical one usually is going to be the least powerful one because you've habituated to overeating. You could eat yourself silly and stuff yourself, but you may be so used to doing that that you don't even realize how uncomfortable it is. So a lot of times focusing on the physical consequence is going to be the least impactful of the three. The other two that are going to make the biggest difference usually is the mental and emotional consequence that kicks off as soon as you take that last bite. And the mental piece is what you're saying to yourself. So again, I want to point out that this is a process. This is something you're going to develop. You're going to develop the awareness and the understanding of what the actual consequence is because you do not know it right now. If you did, you would already have a lower desire for these foods. So as you start to focus in on the mental consequence, what do I start saying to myself when I finish the ice cream, when I finish the cookies, when I finish the chips? What do I start saying to myself? What you're going to notice is it's usually very, very negative. You're usually very hard on yourself. You're beating yourself up. And that leads to the emotions that you experience. So it's the mental mindset, you, what you start saying to yourself, and the emotions you experience as soon as you take that last bite of food. That's what we want to start focusing on. And the emotions you're going to feel are usually in the ballpark of failure, frustration, anger at yourself, disappointment, hopelessness, depression, whatever. It's up to you to figure out which emotions you feel. Everyone feels different ones, but it's up to you to notice what you start saying to yourself, how you start thinking about things, and then what you start feeling. And again, noticing how you feel as well physically. And once you start paying attention to this, what happens is a subconscious mindset shift starts to happen where you start to think about foods, not just on the front end of it, of excitement of getting it and the pleasure of eating it, but now we start to balance that out with the consequence that follows. And the most powerful reason this works is because the consequence phase is by far the longest phase of the three. The anticipation can last a little bit. We can look forward to something for a while. The consumption is the shortest, and then the consequence, the longest one. So once you start realizing this, you start rebalancing the pain, pleasure of these foods in your mind. And yes, the beginning part is pleasurable, no doubt about it. The back end and the majority of it, a lot of times if you want to lose weight and you're worried about your health, is a very negative thing. So it becomes this ultimately painful thing. So again, you, it's up to you to do this because this is how you get the desire for the food in the right spot. You can still enjoy eating whatever foods you want. It comes down to how you're eating them, where your weight's at, where your health's at, how you feel about yourself. But as you start to focus on the consequence that immediately follows, you're going to notice that you start to have much more control over deciding which foods you want to eat. And it's not relying on willpower. So again, I just want to reinforce that this is something you practice and you get better at. This is a skill set um, that you're probably working on for the first time. So give it a little bit of time, but I think you're going to find right away that it gives you, it allows you to tap into much deeper motivation and abilities that you have 
than you've been up till now. So I hope this helps you out. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them. And uh, we'll get into those. Set my new camera. <laughs> my new camera thing is just funny to me. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, the hell wants to think about weight loss on a Friday. I always like to say that. <laughs> Uh, I always joke though, program yourself. Then I always make that joke. The weight loss program yourself then is the only program that anyone ever, you know, orders and signs up with on a Friday <laughs> for the simple reason that it's not a strict, um, miserable process, right? Cause everyone has to wait till Monday. You know, you gotta wait till, uh, you, you know, you gotta wait till you, you, you binge all weekend and I'll start Monday, you know, uh, no, you won't. So, uh, yeah, program yourself then is easy, you know, but again, it's all mindset stuff. We don't want to rely on willpower. Not that we're not going to use willpower sometimes, but we don't want to rely exclusively on it, which is what a lot of dieters are doing. And uh, you're not set up for that. You're not you're not set up to to consciously make every little decision all day long. You're you're set up. We all are. Our brains are set up to run on autopilot. So we um we, the sooner you recognize that, the more you can be way more strategic with your weight. Um, Carrie says that helped me because that's right where I'm at. I hate, love myself, beat myself up, sabotage myself. Yeah, exactly, Carrie. That's what most people do. Most people kind of go one of one two directions after they overeat something bad is they'll either go into denial and just put it out of their mind. Oh, that's the last time. I'm never gonna do that again, okay? Um, or they beat themselves up. But either one really is gonna lead to you doing it again because you never put a new behavior in there. So again, when we make mistakes, we want to learn from them. There's no problem in making mistakes. I don't know if Connie's here. Um, I got to speak with Connie yesterday and uh, she was using a pleasure day that we talked about the program, but she put eight pounds on it. So she's freaking out about it. But what, once we had a conversation, she learned a whole lot from it. And what she learned, I think is going to be way more valuable with her weight ultimately uh, than that temporary eight pound weight gain. You know, So again, if, if you can... Geez, uh, the emotions of, of weight loss, right? And the emotions of, of changing this. But so often you make that mistake and you have all these negative emotions beating yourself up, which ironically just reinforces the behavior. You know, it, it's weird to understand that, but um, that's what happens. So again, it's about understanding, you know, and growing and learning and evolving and using the mistakes we make for good. I, I think that's, again, program yourself then, the program yourself then te technique is the redo rehearsal technique. The redo technique is specifically built to learn from our mistakes because we're going to make lots of mistakes. Now, dieters always think they're going to start on day one and being perfect and just ride that perfection out. But you'll notice if you're a dieter, you have zero ability to get back on track quickly. You don't learn from your mistakes. You make them, you, you go perfect until you make a mistake and then you're totally off course doing nothing again. So we've got to learn from our mistakes and that's got to be part of the process right from the beginning, I think. Um, Purple Lilac, what to do after overeating? Yeah, that, that's it. exactly after overeating. It's opportunity to learn. It really is because Jesus Christ. I mean, how many times you all overeat exactly the same way, you know? And again, you either beat yourself up or you, you just put it out of your mind. That's not going to help you avoid it the next time. So we've got to do something different. So after you overeat, you know, maybe not, well, you could do it as soon as you want. But what I would do is I would go back to five minutes before I overeat and I would say, okay, what led to the overeating? What, what, what went on there? Oh, I'm just, I'm lazy or I got no willpower. What's that mean? You know what I mean? Like it's such a, that doesn't mean anything. Were you starving? Were you pissed off? Did you just have like too much delicious food around you? Uh, were you stressed out? You know what I mean? Like, like there's, there's a million reasons why you may overeat. Now the good news is that you don't eat overeat for a million reasons. You don't overeat for a million reasons. There's a million reasons that people can overeat, but you probably have three or four patterns, behavioral patterns of overeating. And once you get a handle on those four patterns of overeating, you'll probably be way closer to your goal weight. I know this is a different way to think about it, but um, it's a more effective way because <laughs> the typical way that people think about weight loss ain't working, right, folks? You don't even know anyone. Do you, I mean, Jesus, talk about rare. It, it's almost like you have a better chance of seeing Big, Bigfoot than you do someone who loses weight and keeps it off for years in a comfortable, enjoyable way. You ever seen one? <laughs> That's why I do this, you know, trying to, I'm trying to share with you all the things that I've learned. I've walked a different path. I'm thankful for that path. I'm lucky, 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 lucky. So I try to pay it forward. You know, That's why I do these, these calls every day. I do these calls every two. If you've never seen me folks, I do these every day, Monday through Friday. Um, this is what I do. <laughs> I talk about weight all day and night. Uh, this is what I do, but I love it. So I don't care. But, uh, 
anyways, if you are new here, make sure you go to my bio, click the link at the hypnosis session though. That's uh, it's all free. So go check that out. Uh, Sheila says, sometimes no matter how delicious the food, it's not worth the guilt I feel afterwards. And I beat myself up mentally for hours. Exactly, Sheila. This is what I'm trying to say. So instead of, see what people always do and they're like, oh, I can't, I can't stop myself from eating the food. Well, what if you just take a step back and realize it's not as pleasurable as you thought it was? You know, when you look at the full picture, see what I'm saying? This is why you got to understand these three phases of eating, anticipation, consumption, consequence. OK, once you understand that, it changes the game because what you're you're always subconsciously thinking in terms of anticipation and consumption, because, man, listen, we're all we're all brainwashed. All of us brainwashed by the food industry and you know, the diet industry, which are one and the same, um, but the food industry. And so you're all every food ad you see and you, you've seen literally tens of millions of them. It's always the anticipation and consumption of the food. It's always the food coming towards you, the person opening the package up, the first bite of the food. And then, then again, th those initial bites, the, the food coming towards you, the initial bites. That's what every commercial is. They're never showing you the end of the bag, the last of the plate, um, the feeling like shit at the end. They never show you that. OK, and so it's up to you to start getting a clear representation because you're never thinking about the full picture. How pleasurable is the food? So here's another way to think about it. You think the food's so pleasurable. If you zoom out one step and imagine watching yourself eating your favorite food at, at your weight that you're currently at that you may not be happy with if you're not happy with your weight. Don't just imagine eating your favorite food because you're always imagining eating the food first person, right? You're like, you're looking, you're looking at the food. But if you step out one perspective out and you imagine looking at yourself eating the food, you might find that that's not as pleasurable as just looking at the food. Right. And that's because there's less context there. You're not paying attention to the consequence. You know it logically. You know, like, I shouldn't eat this. I don't want to gain weight. I'm not happy with my weight. You know that logically. But emotionally, you ain't feeling none of that shit. You're just focusing on the pleasure of that food. You're completely, and this is just programming, folks. You're just, you've been programmed to just sh turn all this shit out and just focus on the food. And so that's all you see. And so you're just connected to the pleasure. One step out, see yourself overweight, see yourself not happy with your body eating that burger. See how much you think, how enjoyable it is now. I'm not bullshitting you. I'm not making stuff up here. All I'm doing is giving you a little more awareness of what's already there. You just been programmed to not notice that or programmed all the time. That's the magic of hypnosis. You know, you really got to understand hypnosis. If you, if you want to intentionally change your mind, change your behavior, change your reality, and you don't know hypnosis, uh, good luck, good luck, because you got all these subconscious programs that you got to work through. And if you don't understand that, I don't know, good, good luck. <laughs> I just, I, I really truly believe that, you know, but, but yeah, once you start really seeing the full picture of what's going on, it makes a lot of, no, no, just to prove the point, just to show you that you've been programmed to do this with food. Okay. The programmed is that you don't do this with drugs. Right. You don't do this with cocaine, heroin, uh, gambling, smoking. Right. You don't do that. You don't do any of those things. It's not hard for you not to do them either. Because why? You don't just think about the behavior. You don't just zoom in and be like, I feel amazing. No, you zoom out and imagine someone doing it and you don't like that. Right. So with all these other things that you don't you naturally don't do. You take the full picture into account. With the food, you've been conditioned to just think about the food in the moment and eating it. So again, I just get, this is just one tiny little example of the mental programming that's keeping you overweight. And uh, once you start to identify what the little programs are and you fix them, you can limit your goal weight. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to make it sound like so easy. It takes some work to do this, but this is what I'm talking about. You know, you're always fighting against the programs and you forever will. You forever will fight against the programs. And that's what weight loss feels like to you. It feels like you're fighting against yourself. You are. You're fighting against your subconscious programming. It doesn't need to be a fight. It can be a process where you transform your subconscious programming so it supports you living at your goal weight. I sit in front of you as someone who's lost 50 pounds, 54 pounds exactly, and I've kept it off for 30 years. I haven't dieted once. I don't even exercise consistently. It never have. And uh, I did it through reprogramming my mind, changing my behaviors. And that's what I help my clients do. So I hold that out to you as uh, as hope that it doesn't have to be this miserable shit you all have been experiencing this whole time. You know? 
What's up, Don? Yeah, happy pleasure eat day. I know I've been kind of waiting for this week. I don't know. I just been thinking about food a lot this week. I don't know what's up. We don't want to learn. We want to lose weight fast. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. People don't want to learn about shit about weight loss. I don't blame people for that. I don't. I don't really believe that, but I do think that's everyone's programming now. So yeah, if you're a dieter, forget about it. You're, you're just you're trapped in this dieter mindset, and you don't you don't want to hear. But that's why I love doing this because the people that stick around and listen to these lives and listen to the podcast and end up joining my program do want to learn. And those are the people I'm speaking to. I, I know dieters get on here and they're like, "What? Well, what's it? How do I lose weight the fastest?" I, said, oh, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> you know, stop eating. Um, please expand on the four overeating patterns, please. Um, there's not four overeating patterns. There's a million overeating patterns. <laughs> what I'm saying is you yourself, I mean, it's not even four. You, you, user 649, you have three eating habits. You have three eating habits that are 80% of what's keeping you overweight. You're snacking at night, you're overeating at dinner, you're snacking during the day. Those are the big three, but there's other ones. So I couldn't tell you what yours are because I don't know you. But if you started to look at it that way, it'd be a lot more helpful for you. Dieters trying to change everything all at once. It's the goofiest shit ever. You know, it's like, if you listen to me for a few minutes, you'll start to realize dieting is the fucking dumbest plan in the world. And I know you're too smart for it. You're, you're too smart to be dieting, you know, but you just don't, you never hear an alternative. You never, ever, never hear an alternative way to lose weight. Is even, listen, folks, it, it, go take Ozempic. You still have to diet and, and exercise and do your bullshit. It makes it easier. It's not a magic pill as much as they'll make you think it. Okay. You still, at the end of the day, have to change your behaviors and, and something's got to change, you know? So, um, but once you start to break it down into pieces, it becomes a lot easier. You know, can we discuss, can we discuss alcohol? How bad is it for you in regards to weight loss? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think there's no right or wrong with it. I lost weight and I was drinking every day, but I was drinking a beer every day. I, you know, I used to be a binge drinker. I got a hold of that and I continued drinking mildly way. I got everything's relative. So I would drink way more mildly and I was still able to control my weight. Um, and I've since cut it down a lot more, you know, and, and I'll probably just end up at some point not drinking at all. Um, so you can lose, you can, you can do most things and still lose weight. Uh, but the alcohol does make it harder. There's no question about that. A, it's just, it's more calories. B, um, A, B, it, it does affect your, your into your inhibitions. You know what I mean? So it's like, you're, you're more likely to eat the things that you feel like you want to eat. And then there's C, which it tends to kind of make you hungrier, you know, cause I think that that's kind of coordinated with the, the lower inhibitions and less ability to stop yourself. So it certainly doesn't make it easier. That being said, like me, I, at that time when I wanted to lose weight, I did, I never wanted to stop drinking completely. That was just me. Like, again, let me back up a little. I believe that to get the best results, you've got to, you've got to build around you. You have to honor yourself and build your strategy, strategy around who you are good and bad. And so I knew back in the day, even though I was a binge drinker, I, I just did not identify as an alcoholic, even though people are kind of throwing that word around with me, but I just didn't feel it in my gut. And I, I, I'm not, I, I was able to control it and, um, and whittle it down. And so if you had told me, uh, that I had to give up alcohol to lose weight, I probably wouldn't have lost weight because I didn't want, I wasn't in a place to give up alcohol. So I, I just say that I think you have to honor yourself good and bad. Cause I, I moved in a much positive direction. Uh, even though I didn't give up alcohol completely, I became a million times healthier. And so, uh, but, but again, we look at both sides, it makes it a little harder. It's extra calories and all the rest of it. So, you know, that I'll just leave it there, but, but if you honor yourself and you build around who you are, what ends up happening is you have a much more congruent motivation. You know, like, like you just, you feel more congruent. A lot of times people are subconsciously, there's a tug of war going on. You know, so if you say, like, if you like drinking alcohol, sometimes you say, I got to stop drinking alcohol, to lose weight. You get this tug of war where you're like, well, I want to lose weight, but I don't want to give up the alcohol, you know, and now you're incongruent. So for me, I was always very congruent because that was really important to me. I want to have a plan that really resonates with me. And so at that time I wanted to drink alcohol. And so I said, how can I drink alcohol and master my weight? And what that took is it took cleaner eating. I was just thinking about this today. Um, one of the things I stopped eating at night for literally like 26 years. Has it been that long? It was right up until COVID and I never ate at night, not seven nights a week. I never ate at night. And then I remember COVID happened and I tried these, these spicy chips and I was like, holy shit, these are delicious. And I loved eating them. And it was especially, I liked eating them on like Saturday night. Uh, and so I said, I want to eat these chips. So I got to cut calories out someplace else. And one of the things I cut out is I cut out, I was drinking on uh, Thursday nights 
and I'm gonna have one or two beers on Thursday night. Uh, and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of that to, so I can have chips in there. So, so I'm always trading and, and kind of bargaining with myself, you know, for what, what, but what's the most pleasure. So I hope that makes sense. I'm kind of all over the place with this, but I hope that helps. Um, I struggle so bad with binge eating. I can't afford therapy. What can I do? Um, yeah, well, the binge eating, I know. And, and you say that, so it makes me think that I always say with the binge eating, there's two places you want to start with it. You don't want to just stop binge eating. You want to understand it because the binge eating is a symptom of a deeper problem usually. And the deeper problem is usually one of two things that A, you're getting yourself too hungry because you're over restricting and then you can't control your eating or, and, or there's an emotional thing going on that you don't know how to deal with and you use the food to take your mind off of it. And, or you use the binge shame cycle to de deal with that instead of the real emotional thing. So if that's your situation, yeah, and you can't afford therapy, that is hard. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I, I say, I don't know. I don't know enough about your situation to send you in the proper direction, but at least those things with the binge eating, if you're over restricting, that's relatively easy to, to resolve. Um, and the emotional thing's a little more challenging, but I guess I would suggest at the very least, go to my bio and click the link, listen to the hypnosis session. I'm telling you like, like some people in my program were saying this yesterday that, I think one of the biggest things you get out of my program is you you learn to relax and calm down, which is in so such short supply in this environment, right? We're so tweaked up and tense and stressed out and just relaxing and calming down can help us in so many ways. So that might help you even, again, I don't know where what's going on with you necessarily, but um, go, go check that out. It may help you. Uh, what can I do instead of emotional eating? It's my only coping mechanism. Well, I mean, you, you know, like the answer is already in your question. If if the only if the only coping mechanism you have is eating, that's obviously the problem. But the question doesn't become what's wrong with me. How come my only mechanism is is eating? The question becomes what are some other mechanisms I could utilize and rely on that would help me out. And the way you get to that, I think, is really diagnosing the emotions that you're feeling and that you want to feel. So, for example, if you're like, oh, I'm a stress eater, because because none of you are emotional eaters, folks. OK, don't don't do not stop with that. OK, it, it's lazy. It, don't, don't take this personal. It's lazy. I'm an emotional eater. That means nothing. It means nothing. It's a good first step. It's a doorway you walk through into the room, but it's not it's not enough. We need to figure out what emotions. So you're an emotional leader. What emotions? It, it, there's a million emotions. So we need to figure out which ones. And the way we do is we reverse engineer. The last time you emotionally ate, go five minutes before you ate. What emotions were you feeling? I was feeling depressed. Okay. So maybe, you know, you use the, the food to distract yourself from the depression or feel a little bit of pleasure for a moment. But once we recognize, oh, I felt depressed. The next question becomes, what do I want to feel instead? I'd like to feel happy. I'd like to feel connected. I'd like to feel optimistic, whatever. And as soon as you know what you want to feel, the next question is the magic one. How can I feel happier? How can I feel more optimistic in my life? What things can I do that make me feel more optimistic? Not perfectly optimistic, but just a little more optimistic than I feel now. And this becomes the process. It's, it's not, again, I can't just sit here and tell you, oh, do this, this, and this. It, it's something you've got to internalize and start to utilize as a process. Right. I can tell you about brushing your teeth, but you're the one who has got to brush your teeth every day. And if you don't do it every day, it's not going to work. You see? So it's like once you internalize this process, though, it becomes really exciting because you can feel whatever you want within reason. You know what I mean? But, but you can you can really you have so much more capacity to feel things than you realize. You know, so don't don't accept that my only coping mechanism is emotional eating because that's a shitty coping mechanism. It's just a distraction. So there's, there's, you can, you can feel so much more and you can feel so much better, but you got to ask these questions. You go through that process. What emotions am I feeling? What emotions do I want to feel? How can I feel those emotions without food in a, in a consistent, effective, predictable way? Right. Um, you're a hypnotist. Yes, I am a hypnotist. Uh, Connie. Yep. Start Jim spark program. It's free. Oh shit. I just missed that. Um, yeah, there's Connie. Uh, Jim Spark program is free. Try the hypnotic writing. Amazing for healing emotions. Yeah, Connie's a superstar. Connie, I I'm so proud of you for everything you've done. She's lost 30 pounds just with the free stuff I give her. She just joined the program. Um, got to meet her yesterday. She's a superstar. And uh, yeah, you you're awesome, Connie. And that's a great suggestion. I think what she's saying is great. And I'm literally today, I'm recording a training for the, the Spark program. And what it's going to be, it's going to be mo the motivation piece. So it's literally a piece of the program you know, that, that, uh, that I do. 
but I'm going to give you the motivation piece because that's always your struggle, folks. If you're overweight, it's because you don't want to lose weight. You're not motivated. Okay. That's the first problem. The first and biggest problem you got to fix. You ain't even motivated. So don't worry about how you're going to lose weight. You don't even want to lose weight right now. So take one thing, one step at a time, folks. Um, Dorn says, I really like what you said once along the lines of the most enjoyable way to eat a pleasure food is at your goal weight. Yeah, that's a good one, right? Yeah, for sure. The most, uh, the most pleasure you can get out of food is when you're eating it at your goal weight, you know? So, so that becomes the top of the mountain. See, a lot of people are thinking like, oh, well, whether I eat the, who gives a shit food's pleasurable, it's pleasurable. And, and they're thinking like, I don't want to give up the pleasure, but the most pleasure you can get is when you're eating it at your goal weight. Oh my God, it's glorious. People look at that. Oh, Jim, I could never eat like you. I love food too much. Fuck you. I love food more than you do. I bet I love food. Don't give me that. <laughs> and it's like, but I, I think I love food even more because when I'm eating, when I'm eating my cookies, I'm eating my ice cream, I eat my butt, my bullshit. It's 100% pleasure. There's not a shred of guilt. I'm not worried. Do you, you know what I mean? So don't give me that. <laughs> uh, Sarah Sunshine. I never felt calmer and more in control of my food decisions. This program's changed everything. That's awesome, Sarah. I'm going to take a little, little thing of that. Oh, the screenshots. My only problem on my screenshots, I've got like so many of them. Um, yeah, the hypnotic writing is awesome too, by the way. But that's awesome, sir. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, the relaxation is transformative. I know that. It was for me too. That was the biggest thing starting out is I was such a tweaked up tense person. I had a, a tweaked up nervous system to start with. And uh, there was just kind of trauma shit on top of that. And man... Yeah, that's why, I mean, I was just like stuffing shit in my mouth to deal with that, I think. That's what I truly believe. I think I was shoving food in there and I was, uh, and I was uh, drinking, drinking and, and distracting myself, and myself with TV. So yeah, it, it, the relaxation to me becomes the foundation you build upon, you know, for sure. Um, Sheila says, what's your Spark program about, Jim? Um, Spark program's free. So uh, if you go to my bio, click the link, get the hypnosis session, uh, you'll get it. I, I Again, it, it's, I, I have it ready to go. I wanted to put like one more training with it. And um, what, what it is, it's, it's just, it's a short, it's a short little thing. It'll probably end up being like 15, 20 minutes, but it's a motivation piece because you all ain't motivated. If you're not losing weight it's, and you want to, it's because you're not motivated. You don't have strategy either. You, you don't have a good plan to do it either. I, I agree with that too. But your core problem is that you're not really motivated. And so I was like, that's probably the most valuable thing I could give you. And it's literally, it's right out of my program. And, um, I don't know if you like it, you know, you get it. There's other stuff in the spark program. I give you the hypnosis session. Um, there's another video I made for you, three steps to master your way, which goes a little bit in depth with the mindset piece and all that. But the motivation piece is like, we'll just see, we'll see where you're at. You know, you think you're motivated. We'll find out this motivation again. You're not going to like it because it's, it's pain based, but the strongest motivation comes from pain. I hate to say that now we can't live in pain. Okay. But the foundational piece of your weight loss journey has got to be pain. We, we layer with pleasure. So again, we live day to day in, in the pleasure. So for me, my core reason I'm so fixated on mastering my weight at the very core of it is my father died at 54 of a heart attack. Okay. So I don't want that to happen to me. I am not going to do anything to, to encourage that result for me. Okay. So my motivation is, is again, at the ground floor, it's the pain. You know this, folks. Again, there's days you don't want to go to work, right? There's days you don't want to go to work. You don't go because you're like, oh, I can't, you know, wait to get that check. I can't wait to go buy something. You're like, shit, I got to go. I want to live in this house. I want to be able to have my electricity. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's always the things you do consistently. It's always a pain floor. I, I hate to tell you that, but but it is. Again, there's pleasure too. I'm not saying it's just pain, but but the things you do consistently, brushing your teeth. Who the hell wants to do that? But you don't want your teeth rotten out. So it's it's always, there's always a pain component to things you actually do. And there's a difference with the pain year. I know you think, oh, Jim, I feel pain from the weight. Not, not what I'm talking about. Um, I always do metaphorically. The pain you, the pain most people feel from the weight is the pain of a heavy backpack full of bricks and you're slunched over and you're carrying it and you know it's painful and you're tired and your muscles ache and you hate it, but you're used to it. And it's a chronic pain. It's a dull, chronic pain. That's how you're experiencing your weight loss. And this training I'm going to give you is uh, the sharp point of a knife. Because if I if I stick the sharp point of a knife, poke you in the side with it, guess what? You're going to take action. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're going to take action immediately. So again, I don't know. You buy into that or you don't. You know, you could. There's still other things in the Spark program I'm going to give you. But um, if you're really serious, you listen to that, and then uh, you'll see what real motivation feels like. Uh.
uh, Connie tried Ozempic, but guess what? It didn't fix my mindset, so it was just another Band-Aid. That, Connie, I'm going to take a screenshot of that because I people don't realize that yet. It won't be long. Um, I have I've had a lot more conversations with people on Ozempic than the average person, and uh, I just find it underwhelming. I, I'm not I'm not. <laughs> Listen, this is what I do, right? But it's like if they came out with a pill that fixed your mindset and was all natural and made you lose weight, I would, I would, I would do other things. <laughs> I would stop doing this and I would say, "Hey, go get the pill. It, it's awesome." You know what I mean? Like I would. I, there's a million things I can do. Okay, for work, uh, I would love that. I would love if they made a natural pill that just fixed your mindset, wanted you to eat healthy food, brought your weight right down. So I'm not against medicine. I'm not against that stuff. I have firsthand interactions with people on it. And it's not the miracle that you may think it is. You probably don't even understand what it does. Um, you still have to do all the shit. It just makes it a little bit easier. And as Connie said, if you don't fix the mindset, it is just a band aid. And the doctors will tell you that if you push them a little bit, you know, they prescribe it because doctors don't know shit about weight loss folks. Not even if they're obesity doctors, they don't really know about weight loss. They know about surgeries and pills that, that may lead to weight loss. They, they don't, this isn't what they do. Very few people do what I do because most of the weight loss industry is people telling you what to do, but your core problem will forever be, how do I get myself to do it consistently? And not too many people talking about that, but I am. <laughs> Deanna says, when you say to tackle your biggest problem first, how do you go about that? Um, well, first you isolate it because again, you're overwhelming yourself. When you all think about weight loss, you overwhelm yourself. When you all think about weight loss, you, you trigger a stress response in yourself because that's how you think about weight loss. You think, shit, I mean, the two most popular diets right now are keto intermittent fasting. I can't think of two better ways to overwhelm yourself instantly. How do you feel when you do keto and intermittent fasting? Do you look forward to it? Do you love it? Does it feel good? Is it fit into your life? Is it comfortable? No. And so, um, what we want to do is we want to strategically look at this in a way that feels comfortable. And so the, the, what I always tell my clients and what we go to work on is it's the worst and first strategy, the worst eating habit you have. We, we pick that first and go to work on it. So again, what's your worst eating habit? And you don't even know, probably that just, again, man, if you're struggling with your weight, folks, it's not you. It's that you literally, you got rocks in your head when it comes to weight loss. You know what I mean? Your brain's been filled with mashed potatoes from the diet industry. <laughs> You just, you know what I mean? Like you don't, I don't, you don't realize that because you, you don't know oh, how here I go. I got to say this though. Once a day, all the things that you're referencing to lose weight, all the diets and approaches are all diets primarily that are owned by big food companies. Weight Watchers was owned by Heinz. Jenny Craig was owned by Nestle. Uh, Atkins food products is owned by the same company owns Carvel, Cinnabon and Onions pretzels. Slim fast owned by the same company owns Ben and Jerry's. These companies aren't going to tell you real strategies to stop eating their bullshit. Why would they? All they care about is the bottom line. You know, they're freaking out about Ozempic. I have no, Ozempic will help more people lose weight than probably anything that's come before it. It's not a long-term solution for most people, but they're freaking out about that. So why would they buy a diet that was actually going to help you and blast it out to the world? It's going to, it's against their core interests. I always joke, if they ever buy program yourself then and blast that out to the masses, I'll eat my words, but they're never going to do that because they don't want you to lose weight. They want you to restrict it in weird diet ways. Keto? Are you fucking kidding me? You're never going to eat carb again? You're going to stay in ketosis? That's your plan? That's your weight loss plan? That's a short-sighted plan, but you're into it because you just want to lose weight quickly because that's what the diet industry has conditioned you to think. So you think like a dieter, you're getting results like a dieter. Dieters, as far as I can tell, when I look at a dieter, you tell me, I say, they say, okay, Jim, there's a dieter standing in front of you. And in my mind, I'm imagining someone who's overweight. You know, I think we associate dieting with being overweight. <laughs> Thank you, Amni. Uh, I appreciate that, Rose. Um, so yeah, when you tackle your biggest problem first is what's your worst eating habit that shows up daily or multiple times a week? Again, it's usually snacking at night, overeating at meals, snacking in the afternoon are the big three just to start with. And there, people have other ones too, but those are the big three. And so you tackle those You and you tackle them. You look at it and you say, if I could get rid of my evening eating, holy shit. That, and I mean, get rid of it. I don't mean, oh, if I can stop overeating for a couple of weeks and see how much weight I lose. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about genuinely resolving your worst eating habits with new, better strategies and a better mindset underneath it. I, I did that with my, my, I snacked at night. That was my worst eating habit. And I got rid of it in this way. And now I haven't snacked at night for 30 years. So I'm talking about long-term strategy and solution that really resolves it. You're not thinking about weight loss this way. You're thinking about how can I change everything so I can lose weight the fastest and then I'll figure it out later. 
No, you won't. You know, so that's uh, that's what I mean. Hazel says I reached my target of 12 stone, been stable four weeks. Is it safe to lose another 14 pounds? My BMI is 27. Um, I mean, that's not really a question I can answer. You know, I mean, I, I guess that, that's a doctor one. I don't know what's safe or not to lose for each person. So um, I'll have to leave that between you and your doctor. But congratulations. I think that's wonderful. I, I love the stable for four weeks. I, I love that because Hazel means that means she's she's got some patience with this. OK, so super, super job. Um, yeah. And if you if you want to lose another 14 pounds again, if it is safe, if your new doctor decided it is a safe thing to do. Uh, yeah, I think that being stable for four weeks is a wonderful foundation to build that on. You know, so great job. Great job. Uh, Don says I dropped alcohol last April. And after hearing you, I realized that was my diet brain. Now I drink. Oh yeah, there you go. Right. <laughs> again, I, I drink, but I drink moderately. Like it, again, it, it all comes back to this thing. And I, oh, I, I kind of do this one. I, I was just making videos and I forgot about this. I love this phrase. I'm about to tell you guys. Is uh, my favorite phrase lately. And I love this one is that I don't want to be the healthiest person I can be. And I love saying that because it cuts through the bullshit and it gets you, it brings you right into reality. You don't want to be the healthiest person you can be either. Cut the shit. You don't. Because <laughs> the healthiest person you can be, there's no processed food. There's no alcohol. There's no screens. You know what I mean? Like, like you don't, you don't want to. So again, once we get past that bullshit, we get into the land of the real. And now we can decide where do I want to be? And really what that comes down to is kind of like, what gives me the best quality of life? Where do I want to be? I like drinking some wine on the weekends. I like it. And um, at this point in my life. And so again, I don't like drinking too much wine, right? Then I don't like that. So there's a sweet spot for me right now. And I aim for it. But again, I like to say like most dieters are, are black and white thinkers. And I live in the gray area. I think life is a, is a gradients of gray. And I live in that gray area. And I acknowledge that I'm not doing the healthiest thing possible. And I'm fine with that. Um, but I'm also not doing the worst stuff possible either. I'm not just putting out of my mind. And I, I kind of, I always think like surfing. I'm always kind of surfing my my bad habits, my bad eating, you know, things I do. And, and there's a sweet spot, I think. You know, and I think if you start thinking that way, it, it's a better thing for you. Um, please explain what can I, what can I do before eating a pint of ice cream? How can I convince myself? Um, now that's a great question. Again, you, you don't have to convince yourself of shit. You just have to look at things more honestly. So the simplest thing I could tell you is you're sitting, you know, you, you're, you're sitting on the sofa and you're like, oh, I want to eat a pint of ice cream. Okay. And so what you're always doing subconsciously, you're thinking about getting that ice cream and eating that ice cream. And that's driving the cravings and the desire through the roof. And now you're trying to use your willpower to fight against that and not do it. What I would suggest instead is you sit there when you're considering whether to eat it or not. Don't do not try stopping yourself. Do not. Instead, ask yourself and recognize, acknowledge, yeah, it's going to taste good. I like the pleasure of the beginning part. How will I feel five minutes after I finish eating it? And just be honest with yourself. How will I feel um, when I finish it? He says, I'll feel fine. Great. Go eat the pint of ice cream, but pay attention. Five minutes after you finish, do I feel fine physically, mentally, emotionally? Am I happy I did it? If you are, great. Don't change anything. But if you're unhappy with it, if you're like, oh, why did I do that again? Oh, shit, now I feel gross. Now I'm not going to lose any weight. This sucks. I don't want this. Okay. And then the next time the pint comes around and you ask that question, you say, yeah, it's pleasurable. I like eating it. But then afterwards, I feel let down. I'm kind of frustrated with myself. I feel discouraged. I'm kind of annoyed with myself. So I go to bed. I don't sleep well because I'm thinking about it and my, the sugar in my system. And I just don't like it. Well, now all of a sudden, there's no convincing necessary here. You're just, I want you to just look at things honestly. Folks, you've got the truth on your side. You don't realize this because you've been hypnotized by the food companies to only think about the front end pleasure of the food. Again, you don't do this with cigarettes, cocaine, and heroin, right? You're not tempted to do any of those things. Millions of people are addicted to those substances, not you. Is it because you've got amazing willpower? Is it because you convinced yourself not to do them? Or is it because the way you think about them you naturally think about the consequences first. So with the food, you've been hypnotized by the food companies to just think about the front end pleasure. And you don't think about the consequences hardly at all. You think about the long-term consequences, but you don't think about the short-term consequences that follow emotionally, mentally. Hope that helps. Um, Best Fleb, how's it going? Welcome. Connie says, always figured I was a frantic lunatic, <laughs> LOL, but now I know I just needed to program relaxation. And Connie, 1000%. I was a frantic lunatic. I was 
Like I went to a big high school and I was just the craziest. I was out of control. You know what I mean? College, I was out of control. And so it is, I was, I was on my way. I, I, I always, I swear I believe this. I discovered all this shit. I, I took a semester off from college and I was getting ready to go to my, the, the school I ended up graduating from as a business school. And uh, I had a semester off. And in that semester, everything changed for me. I got exposed to yoga, hypnosis, personal development, Tony Robbins, meditation, guitar, martial arts. I swear to God. And um, it, it just changed the whole trajectory of my life. And I think where I was going with things is I think I was going to go to business school. I was going to, I got my degree in finance and investments. And I think I was on my way to New York, be a stock, stock broker, stock trader. And uh, it's just funny. Life's funny. So that's who I thought I was. And once I started relaxing, calming down, it turned out I am a completely different person. Completely. I'm still me, but a completely different version of me. This is what I'm trying to always tell you guys. This is why I say what you want to wrap your weight loss and personal development. Make this a process of becoming the best version of you possible. You know, because there's so much more that you can experience here than just the weight going down. It really is a transformative experience. You know, when I work with my clients, they're, they're always... They're not just losing weight. They are absolutely transforming into the best version of themselves. Their relationships. I don't know if Jody's getting to it here, but um, Jody's like, she's like, yeah, the, the weight, weight stuff's cool. And then mine's is cool. But she's like, my relationship with my, my husband's better. My relationship with my kids are better. That's what I'm trying to say. Not because you lose weight and you look better. They don't give a shit about that. They, they, the relationships improve because you're more calm. You're more present. You're not in your head pissed off at yourself. You're not eating shitty food and feeling lethargic and tired. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not the visual weight piece of it that influences your life the most. It's the fact that you're this better version of yourself, you know, cause you're living the way that you truly want to, you're eating the way you truly want to. And it just feels congruent and it feels good. That's what I'm trying to tell you all. You're that's not how you're thinking about weight loss though. You don't even want to start losing weight cause it's miserable from the day one all the way to through when you quit. It doesn't have to be, you know? Um, and it says, thank you so much for these lives, Jim. You are welcome. That's why I do them. What do I do if eating is literally the best part of my day and I constantly think about it? Yeah, again, folks, if, if eating's the best part of your day, th that's a symptom of a much deeper problem. You know what I mean? You're a human being on planet Earth in 2024. There is a lot of opportunity for you to find wonderful things to do. There really is. Again, this brings it back to, this is always a personal development process, in my opinion. You know, so it's not about making the food less enjoyable. It's about finding other things that are more enjoyable than the food. And there's there's things around you that are way more enjoyable. And so it's about figuring out what they are, you know? But that's the process. It's not It's not trying to eat less food. I hope that makes sense. You know, what a lot of people do, this makes just a quick point I want to make is that if you think, see, like, like the, the, diet, the diet mentality is all about stopping doing things you like to do, right? In a nutshell, dieting is basically, it, it's an anti, it's an anti tactic. It, it's like, okay, I usually do this for pleasure. I'm going to stop doing this, right? But what ends up happening is you create a void. Nature abhor, abhors a vacuum and your mind abhors a vacuum. But that's what you're doing when you go on a diet is you're just, you're, I can't do that now. This is how I have pleasure. Can't do that now. Can't do that for pleasure. Can't do that for pleasure. So what ends up happening is now you have no pleasure except for the, the, the random excitement of the scale moving down. But that doesn't make up for all the lack of pleasure in all the other areas of your life now that you feel because you're not eating because that was the only pleasure you had. So for me, that the process for you, M specifically, becomes not about don't eat, don't feel pleasure. It becomes let's find pleasure in other ways. And I know you haven't looked for that. I, not not in a consistent, congruent way. What can I, what other things in my life can give me pleasure? And once you find those things, it will only take a couple of them. Because I know playing guitar for me, I don't even draw, but I want to draw more. Uh, I love playing basketball. I love going for walks with my dog. I love playing with my kids. I love going on a date with my wife. So there's a lot of things I love doing, and it's, it's, it wasn't always like that. It used to be me. I'd sit in front of the TV and watch TV for eight hours a day, do nothing. You know, I, I play basketball and stuff back then, but I do that for a little bit and I'd sit, watch TV for eight hours. It's like, I couldn't do that now if I tried. So, so again, it's a, it's a development. It's a personal development, making yourself into a better version of yourself. It's not just about cutting all the pleasure out of your life in the form of food. I hope that makes sense. Um, what's up, Pizzo? Hello, one. Yeah, obviously you're Italian. I knew that. I knew Pizzo, but then I see the, the Italian flag and then I see this Italian language. 
<laughs> oh, that's changed the mindset. Is that what that means? Oh, there's Jody. I never thought I would have stopped binges, but the program helped me calm down to think. Yeah, exactly, folks. Y'all, you don't realize this. You don't think of it this way, but we all are multiple personalities. And the hypnosis, one of the things that's so valuable to understand is that we're always in trances. We're in different trances. We're literally different versions of ourselves. And so the version of you listening to this right now is different than the version of you tonight at eight o'clock when you sit on the sofa and want to eat ice cream. You know, they're two different people. And so once you start to understand this, you can, um, you can make some pretty drastic changes because you've got all the, you really do have a lot of the wisdom and the answers inside of you. You just haven't learned how to uncover them. That's one of the main things I help my, my clients do. You know, and I says, you're awesome too, Jim. Thank you. Blessed to have you saving my life. Well, wow, thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, the hardest part is doing it I, in the moment. In the moment, I know what I should do. Mindset is everything. Oh, that's what I mean though. Yeah, best fleet. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, the hard part is doing it. But it, it it is like it is, but it, but it, why? It, it's not because you don't know what to do. It's because of the state that you're in. I mean, think about this, folks, right? Why do you make good, you make healthy choices, food choices sometimes, and then sometimes you make unhealthy food choices. So you got the same knowledge in your brain. You know what's healthy and what's unhealthy. So it's not a knowledge problem. So what leads you to choose the right healthy food sometimes, the unhealthy food other times? I would suggest that it's the mood you're in. When you're in a good, focused, calm, relaxed, healthy mood, you choose the healthy foods. It's easy. It's natural. It's automatic. It's not hard to do it at all then. Uh, but then when you're in a stressed mood or pissed off or frustrated, then it's hard. And it's, I don't give a shit. Who gives? Who gives a shit? I don't care. You know, and then you choose that. So what I, I, I find this crazy <laughs> that all weight loss, it doesn't come down to more knowledge. See, you keep looking for more knowledge. Holy shit. The keto diet. What, what do you what magic do you think? What do you think is any different from that from the paleo diet for you? Why could you go all the way into ketosis? That's what's going to do it this time. You know, it's like, holy shit. And it's like, you don't have any, any ability to manage your moods. You, you don't, you don't have any ability to manage your moods. I know this because this is what I do. I've been doing this professionally for 20 years. I work with smart, intelligent, successful people, successful professionally, personally, and all the other areas of lives. But wait though. Hmm. Can't figure that one out. So it's not you. It's the fact that you literally have no strategy at your disposal. <laughs> <laughs> just because you could tell me about what to eat. Who gives a shit? That's a, you think that's what matters? What matters is, do you have an ability to change how you're thinking or feeling in the moment? Do you? And I know you don't. So yeah, that is the hardest part, but it's, it's not, I'm not saying like, like, again, when I, I, this is what I, this is the main thing I help my clients with is how to make the right choices, but it's not, it's not a willpower secret. It's not me telling them what to do. It's me showing them how to feel differently. If that makes sense. Cause you're right. It is the hardest part is doing it, but your answer is like, well, I just got to get myself to do it. I know what to do. Mm. But what if you wanted to do it? You do hard shit all the time, folks, <laughs> taking care of your kids, living with your partner, going to work, make a dinner, <laughs> just living life in 2024 is hard. And you do it all the time because you know how to do it. And you got the right mindset under it. So weight loss is the same thing. Once you have the right strategies and the mindset under it, it's, it's, you just do it. Donnie says, I'm on intermittent fasting now. I'm not sure. I love it. I've lost a few pounds though. Um, well, good job for you, Donnie, for taking action. Uh, I'm, you know, program yourself thin is, uh, program yourself thin is a diet agnostic program. You know what I mean? So I have people doing everything. There's keto people, there, there's carnivore, there's vegans and vegetarian, there's everything. Cause it's really not about what you're eating. I'm not a nutritionist I'm, I, and I don't give a shit anyways. Cause even if I was, I want you to figure out the plan that works for you. So I help people with all different things. So I just wanted to preface that by saying, um, that I don't think there's any right or wrong is only what works for you. You know, that being said, play with the fasting longer. Uh, but if you don't love it, tweak it, or do something else. There's a million ways to lose weight. I think if you build around you, you're going to be better off. You know, that's what I think. And so, uh, so I'll give you an example of what I mean specifically. I've been intermittent fasting for 30 years, but I never called it intermittent fasting. When I started, it's just something I came up with because I was making a bigger and bigger window between when I went to bed and when I stopped eating. And so it turned out that I would stop eating and, and still, because this has been 30 years, I usually stop eating six, seven o'clock at night and I'll eat the next day, seven or eight o'clock. So it's like 13 hours. Now, again, I, I wouldn't say intermittent fasting anyways, because the intermittent fasting police will be on my case, you know, because, oh, that's not 16 hours. And that's where we get into the problem. 
you know, with this diet mindset that that 16 hours has some magical effect on your body. It does not. <laughs> it's just a smaller eating window to try and compress it and then then eat better because you have less to focus on. But for what a lot of people happens to is the 16 hours is overwhelming. It would be for me. I did that. I don't eat till noon. And I, if I'm going to noon, I get so hungry. I feel woozy. I, I feel hungry. I'm thinking about food the whole time. It didn't work for me. And so if it works for you, great, you know, but if it doesn't work for you, tweak it, you know, try cutting out, go 12 hours, you know, see that way. But, but again, I guess the main message I'm saying is be flexible with it. Be flexible because being flexibility of your diet is probably the number one indicator of long-term success. And most diets are extremely rigid with keto being the, the goofiest of the bunch. Okay. And so, um, keto is literally the goofiest of the bunch. But anyways, <laughs> Sheila says it's, it might be hard to find something that gives you the same instant hit as food. Um, yeah, Sheila, how about cocaine? I bet cocaine gives you a bigger hit than the food. <laughs> I'm messing with you, Sheila. But, but what I mean is, you know, fine. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe food's the biggest instant hit you can get, but we don't value. I'm when I say cocaine, I'm joking. But the point I'm making is that you're probably not. When I say that you're like well, cocaine, I don't want to co do cocaine. I don't want the instant hit of cocaine. Yeah. And I don't want the instant hit of the food. <laughs> I don't even eat much processed. I don't want food. You know, the, cause let's get into the food. Let's talk about instant hits of food. Cause you're right. Um, there's a great book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, that really breaks down uh, how to make food addictive. And this is just a whole conversation because you all think you know, the, these processed foods are created by chefs and kitchens uh, and they're not. They're made by chemists and labs. And so, yeah, let's talk about hits of food because there's the hit of food you get from eating a carrot and an apple. And then there's the hit of food you get from eating Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And so the Ben and Jerry's ice cream is a way bigger hit. You know, so if you're going to accept the fact that you're going to make your food decisions based on which one gives you the biggest hit, you're fucked because the biggest hits from food are the ones that are the worst for you because that's how they're engineered. They're the most unnatural, hyper palatable processed food you can eat. Again, I'm picking on you a little bit, but we got to get out of that mindset. I, I would not doubt that the biggest hit. Um, well, you said it might be hard to find something that gives you the same instant hit as food. I don't think that's true. I think cigarettes will give you a hit like that. I think cocaine would certainly give you a hit like that. Um, heroin, I hear, is probably a great hit. Crack, which is just another version of cocaine. Um, those are all real hits. Gambling, you know, is probably a great hit. Uh, shoplifting might be a big hit if that's how you're wired. <laughs> I'm kind of joking, but I'm not because I list all those things. And you're like, oh, cut it out. Stop it. Stop it. But this is food we're talking about. Well, are we really talking about food? Are we talking about food? Or are we talking about, I just got the age restricted things. I was talking about drugs. Um, are we really talking about food? Or are we talking about food stuff? And this is another way to look at it because folks, the food that you're eating, if you're eating a lot of processed food, the food companies are the exact same companies as the cigarette companies. <laughs> you do not believe me? Nabisco and RGR Reynolds are literally merged together as the same company. The parent company of Kraft is Philip Morris. The cigarette companies in the 70s saw the writing on the wall and they were starting to associate cigarettes to lung cancer. So they divested from cigarettes, went into the food industry. And you can watch, you can look on graphs, go look at the obesity rates from the 70s, early 80s until now. And it's like this, whoop, type two diabetes and that. And these cigarette companies went into food with the exact same philosophy to make the most addictive product possible, to market in the most aggressive way they possibly could and to sit on the science of how bad it is for us. So I can list all these drugs off as great ways to get first hits. And you say, well, I wouldn't want to do that. But the food, you don't think that way about. But it's not real food either. So it, it's literally, it's drug-like food. It's processed food to literally give you that first hit. So I wouldn't disagree with it. But I'd also say, if you take a step back and really think about what it is, you might start to feel different about it. What's up, Shomanique? How's it going? I've been thinking about you today. I've been meticulously paying attention to how I feel after eating and just switching to primarily not eating processed foods, even without any weight loss has made me feel so much better. That's super. And, and understand that sets you up for the weight loss. Even if that doesn't create the weight loss initially, it is going to set you up for your weight loss. That's a firm foundation you're building on. When we're eating a lot of processed foods, folks, you're just, you're fucked. You're just good luck. Good luck. It's like people asking me like, well, how do I deal with sugar cravings? That's like, like a cocaine addict saying, how do I deal with the cocaine cravings? 
well, you're going to have to stop doing cocaine. I'm not saying you have to stop eating sugar because they're not the same in that way. But if we're eating a lot of processed food, you can't even get your bearings right. You, you really can't. So great job, Shomini. That is super duper. And I'm telling you, that's setting you up foundationally to build on for your success. I promise you. How can I keep me motivation with life and all? Um, yeah, I mean, life motivation, that's a whole nother story. I mean, that's why, again, for me personally, I think you got to take your weight loss rapid and personal development. Make this about being the best version of you possible. Make living, eating healthier, weighing what you want to weigh. Um, make that make that be the the focus because it'll help you achieve all the big things that are important to you in life. I think a big mistake people make is they try and all of a sudden just make the weight loss more important. But I think the better way to do it is to take the things in your life that are already really important that you're already committed to and weave it around that. Um, that may be your work, your education, your kids, um, your personal development, whatever is really important to you. Everyone's got different things they're really committed to. Start weaving how being slimmer, healthier, fitter, eating better, living healthier is going to benefit all those things that are already important to you. And I think you're going to find there's a lot more motivation there. Um, Pizzo says, get your mindset right, eat what you can grow, pick or kill, eat proportionate and walk every day. That's a great strategy. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Do you have any tips to do when you want to overeat? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. When you want to overeat, I think that's a great that you put it that way. I like to diagnose it. Why do I want to overeat? Is it because I'm really hungry, right? That's probably the number one trigger of wanting to overeat because when you get hungry, again, we've evolutionary evolved to want to eat as much as we can. So when we get hungry, we super trigger that. So um, be careful of it. But yeah, if you're really hungry, that's a, that's going to be one of the main reasons. And so um, <laughs> she also so true, Jim. I think I'll steer clear of drugs though. I get that, right? But that that's how I feel about those foods, you know, because I know they're so addictive and I know they're they're designed to give you that hit and get you addicted to it and make you overweight and miserable. So why do you avoid the drugs though? Right. This is what I'm trying to tell you. It's all conditioning. You've been trained and conditioned to think that way subconsciously about the drugs. So you think about it. I don't think so. I don't think I want those. But then it comes to the food. Well, I love the food. What's going to make me feel that pleasurable? You know what I mean? So it's like it's nothing more than than conditioning. It's not real either because those foods aren't real. So, well, Jim, I got to eat. Those aren't even real foods. You're not talking about real food. You're talking about drug like foods. So anyways, um, yeah. So when you want to overeat again, I think it's more about preventing that, that, that thing. And usually again, it's over restricting, gets you so hungry that you don't give a shit. You just want to eat everything in sight and or emotionally, um, you're stressed out, you're depressed. Some emotion comes and makes you want to overeat. It's usually one of those two things. And so as you start to pay attention to that and start to really resolve it, I think that's how you, you know, start to deal with the overeating thing, you know? Oh, come on, Pizzo. You don't overeat. That that does not work. That, I will tell you, does not work. To just say, like, oh, I'm just not going to overeat. Yeah, okay, good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. If it was that easy, no one would have a weight problem. You know what I mean? Again, there's got to be a deeper, I think, solution to to deal with that, you know? Um, User 649, thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Tanya says, the health consequences are so neglected. Yeah, absolutely. I, I find that just crazy, crazy. Um Filter comments similar to those flagged by our community. I always like to turn. I love the the shitty comments. <laughs> I was trying like like don't um don't don't filter any comments down TikTok. Send them through. <laughs> Amy says my husband and children had McDonald's today. I pictured myself eating it, my goal weight, and didn't want it. There you go. There you go. Right. That's what I mean. I, I'm telling you, folks. You know, people are always like, oh, I don't have the willpower to eat like you do. It, it's not willpower. It really is not. I'm not saying there's not a little bit of willpower. It's like 10, 15, 20% of willpower for sure. But it's it's 80, 90% mindset. Like the way I think about fast food, I don't want it. The same way that you don't want cocaine and heroin. You know, it's not because you're fighting off the cravings. You're not, you're not fighting off cigarette cravings all day, right? You, you just don't, you don't want them. You don't have any because the way you think about it. You can do the same thing with food. I promise you, you know, great job, Amy. That's great. What a difference. That's so super that you did that. Um, as it says, I haven't eaten McDonald's in two years. Nice job. Doxy mom. I try not to replace it with shopping. No joke. No, fair enough. Fair enough. That's legit. That's a real thing. Um, we gotta be careful of that. Right. So yeah, we don't want to substitute. Well, I, you know, that, that being said, like, like, and I know, like that idea that we we take one bad habit and replace it with another bad habit. Um, that's not ideal, I suppose. But also, it's like we take one bad habit and replace it with a bad habit that's not as bad. I'm okay with that. You know, I'm just looking for improvement. So, but I get it. Yeah, the shopping thing. I, I understand what you're saying with that. 
Um, what's up, kitty? I'll eat really well for two weeks, then I just eat everything. It's a loop. Um, yeah, well, that's the problem. I mean, when you say eat really well for two weeks, what a lot of times what that's code for for people is like, well, I eat no carbs, I eat no sugar, I eat 1200 calories, I tracked every calorie. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's just so intense, you know, um, that you can't keep it up. So, you know, the, the secret to that is not to start off with some overwhelming, unsustainable method, right? Um, Carol says, hi from New Zealand. Today I have an event and for a change, I'm now thinking I have strategies. Great job. Great job, Carol. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Cause we're always pre-programming ourselves. So it's like when we're going to social situations, restaurants, different things, a lot of times we're already anticipating, expecting that we're going to overeat and, um, we have control over that part. We can anticipate that we have strategies and we're going to eat great. You know? Jody, I've uh, been listening to your podcast every morning on my two mile walk with the dog. Super. That's awesome. Jody. Great job. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of my clients are listening to it all the time too. It, it's good. Again, I always say this, that, that it, I am saying a lot, I, th I think valuable information, but I'm also speaking in a way uh, that hopefully is going to influence your subconscious mind. So I am a hypnotist. I, I am using strategies and techniques to, to influence you and help you out uh, in more ways than just information. So great job. Great job walking. Great job listening. This is exactly my problem. I know you're right. It's like a light switch. I'm on or off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's the diet mindset though. You know, that's why I say one of the most valuable things you can do is to get off the weight loss path and get on the weight mastery path. The weight loss path is just about how can I get to my goal weight as fast as possible. The weight mastery path says, I want to live at my goal weight for the rest of my life on near autopilot. That's the goal. And so it's a completely different goal. And once we start thinking that way, we get off that all or nothing mindset, you know, and you start setting yourself up for long-term success. So great job recognizing that though. Um, Kara, so thanks so much, Jim. I'm soaking up what you say for hours every day at the moment. And that's great. You'll see it's going to help you. I mean, again, the more you listen to me, just you'll find it, it works better. Jody's working on the blueprints. Yeah, great job, Jody. That's awesome. And make sure you get on those calls on Tuesday. So if you have any questions on them, um, you can ask those as well. Uh, all right, Jim. What's up, Miri? How's it going? Yeah. Yeah. Um, she says it's so easy to feel overwhelmed by all the dieting recommendations on social media. My TikTok stories are full of them, but I end up doing nothing crazy. Yeah, Sheila, listen, a confused mind is a stuck mind. It doesn't do anything. A, a confused mind just does what it always did. So yeah, that's a big challenge. And that's where we're at right now. That's one of the biggest challenges for people that want to lose weight is that you, uh, is that you have so many ideas in your head, you don't know where to go. You know, and so that, yeah, that's, that's a challenge. That's why I, again, I will say like my program is unique in that way because it's a completely different goal. So it kind of, it, it quiets a lot of the noise right off the bat because we have a different goal. It's to master your weight. And you'll, you'll find that all 100% of the stuff you're seeing on social media is about how you can lose weight quickly. And how you lose weight quickly and how you lose weight long-term are two totally different things. So yeah, that'll get confusing. Um, can hormones block you from losing weight? Uh, no, they can influence you for sure. So, so there's definitely hormonal physical challenges that people can have. Um, but nothing I've seen can block you from losing weight long-term if you reduce calories. Um, and I've worked with people with PCOS, Hashimoto's, thyroid issues, everything. And I've seen everyone lose weight. So I've never seen anything that can prevent someone from losing weight, no matter what they cut for calories. Uh, we all have our challenges might take longer, but I lose weight and then perimenopause. Yeah, exactly. I like the way you said that drug like foods. Yeah, well, they really are. That's literally what they're like. And they're, they're designed that way. They're designed that way. So yeah, Jane, don't lose hope. Jane, do not lose hope because that that's part of that. That's that mindset. So again, folks, I always say this, but I, I really encourage you to do, it, especially you, Jane, I don't want you to lose weight or lose hope. I want you to lose weight. Uh, is go to my bio, click the link at the hypnosis session, watch the video I made though, three steps to master your weight. And I think you'll see that, uh, it's a different approach and I think it might, it might kind of calm down some of your fears. So, all right, everyone, I gotta get out of here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, comments and questions. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, remember go to my bio, click the link at the hypnosis session, watch the video I made for you. Uh, read the emails I send you, listen to the podcast I make for you every day, Monday through Friday. It's called Program Yourself. Then it's on all of the platforms. So go check it out. Um, Jill says, whenever I catch your lives, you talk so much sense, Jim. I got to take a look at your program for some clarity. Thank you. Yeah, Sheila, go check it out. Um, there's nothing, <laughs> if you think these are valuable folks, uh, working with me, and that's, you can work with me directly. You know, we have coaching calls twice a week. And so 
it is very transformative. And so, yeah, if you ever want to work with me, go check out the program, program yourself then. And um, yeah, if you really want to take it to the next level, but thank you so much, everyone have a super weekend and we'll talk soon. Bye.